This edition of Mac Voices is supported by you, our viewers and listeners, through our new Patreon campaign. If you get value from Mac Voices, please consider helping support the show by visiting patreon.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, I've got another Take Control author back for a new Take Control title. What's really exciting about this one? Well, there are a couple things. First of all is the title, um, and it is called Take Control of Your Productivity. Second, Mr. Jeff Porton is the author, and he has never been on Mac Voices before. I have no idea how this happened, but we've got him here. Jeff, welcome. It's good to see you. Thanks a lot, Chuck. I appreciate being here. Hey, I, I'm, I'm delighted to talk to you. We we tried to get together at CES this year, and I got sick part of the time, and then the schedule got crazy, and we, we yeah. weren't able to. But I've been looking forward to this because I've known about this title for a little while, and productivity is one of my favorite things. So where do you even start with a, with a title that, that, that broad? I mean, wh- how did you approach productivity? Well, the, the, my first step is I've been reading books on productivity literally since I was in college, you know, 30 years of this stuff. And I mean, there's a couple of very famous books and I read most of, I read all of those and most of the ones that were not particularly, uh, uh, you know, I, I read a lot of obscure ones as well. And almost all of them had good ideas and bad advice in terms of how to implement it. Or they had good implementation ideas if you are exactly the same kind of person as whoever is writing the book. So my first step was to not do that. Um, I took the approach that there is an introductory section where we talk about what does productivity mean to you? You know, it's not necessarily about doing more things. It could be about doing the same things but being less stressed or being happier about it. It could be about doing more of some things and less of others, or it could just be increasing your, your outcome. I mean, the reader is supposed to decide for themselves, and I walk them through just ways to think about that process and how they should, uh, you know, go from one end of that to the other. Uh, then we, do you have a question? That was an interesting look on your face. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I, I okay. really, that's a, that's a fascinating way to start off approaching it. Instead of saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, asking me to sort of define or redefine productivity for my own space and, and what it means to me, that, well, the, that's a great way to do it. I mean, to me, this, this is something that I, you know, I'm, I'm middle-aged now, and this is something I've learned over the last, you know, 20 years. When, when I was younger, like mid-20s, I thought I was going to become a productivity machine, you know, get everything done, um, you know, just, just, you know, work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and just, you know, light, light the world on fire. And, you know, I'm realizing since then that it's not sustainable, it's, uh, it burns out your engines, you end up not enjoying your work. So... If somebody wants to do that, then I've got strategies for incre- increasing your productivity. But there's a section of the book that says you should determine what your like, your best good day. You know, the, the one day where you said at the end of the day, what is you know the greatest day you ever had in terms of getting things done, and then that's your peak. That's your the best day you ever had is your peak performance. But you don't shoot for that because for the same reason that you know somebody who's working out doesn't work out 24 hours a day. You do that occasionally when you need to. But your peak, you, what you should go for is the peak you can sustain on a day-to-day basis that you, never burns you out, that you can do the same thing this week and six months from now. So I walk people how to, how to determine that and how to determine what their peak is that they need to get to occasionally. And then what they should plan for is their track record at first. So if you know what your best is that's a sustainable number, like you have an idea for that. You don't plan for that on day one because you're not there yet. You're at your normal output. You plan for your normal output. You use techniques and and modification techniques to try to improve that. Once you've improved a little, then you can plan for that. And you keep on going until you get to the the top level that's sustainable for you. If you have to, for example, write a book in a shorter period of time than you'd like to, then you can go to peak for, for a little while, but only for a temporary and defined amount of time, and then you go back to peak sustainable. So part of defining your productivity is to say, well, why am I doing all this? Why am I putting this time and effort into it? Why am I devoting my energy to this? Is it because do I want to make money? Do I want to get a promotion? Do I want to uh, uh, have my peers and family be proud of me? Or do I just love my job and I feel like it's a calling and I want my work to reflect that? I want my outcomes to reflect the fact that I love what I do and I think it's important. 
people have different reasons to do what they do. And I walk people through how to define that and how to decide what's important to them. And then obviously these are, you know, these are 30,000, this is the high altitude view to, to, to do this. Um, and then I walk people how to, how to get from there to, okay, well, what am I doing on Tuesday at 4 p.m.? And eventually, you know, it takes time. It takes trial and error and, and, and an iterative process. But eventually what you're doing on Tuesday reflects the decisions you made at the beginning of the process. And then at the end of the book, I say, do this in three months, do this in six months, do this in a year to make sure that your goals haven't changed and that your plans have your, your big picture goals haven't changed. So what you're doing on Tuesday reflects what you still want to be doing with your life. And to me, I mean, this is, this is my personal opinion, is that all of that, I mean, we only get one go round on this planet, right? And if you're not happy and fulfilled and enjoying yourself while you do all of this, then you, in my opinion, you've got the wrong goals, but somebody else can choose that to say, no, I'm willing to sacrifice my happiness for this. But I say, at least consider it. You know, sometimes, some things you do, like for instance, I, I should lose 30 pounds, right? But I've decided my quality of life from having a Philadelphian diet is such that I don't want to do what it's going to take to lose 30 pounds just yet. Eventually, I'll gradually do it, but I'm making a quality of life decision there. Other people can do that in terms of how they arrange their day, how, what work they do, how they manage their work, and that's the whole process. So that's a long-winded answer to say why there is a discussion at the front of the book about big-picture ideas and, and approaches, how people should define it for themselves, and then at the end of the book, how to bring it all back together and make sure that that's always in the loop as to what they're considering, not every day, but on a regular basis. That answer your question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's and there's so many questions that I want to follow up with. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So let's let's start with take control books. Take control okay. books typically, not not all of them, but the majority of them, tend to focus on one program or one particular discipline. Sure. And again, we're back to the productivity being so broad. So is this something where you advocate certain software tools, or is this nope. more of a technique thing? I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because this has been the bulk of the back and forth between me and my editor, Joe Kissel. Um, I mean, we've had a number of round trips where I, I mean, the first draft of the book had a lot more philosophy and not a lot of software. And he said, I want more software. But that gave me a problem because I want to write the book. I want the same philosophy for the software. I don't want to tell you to use, I mean, I use OmniFocus, right? I don't want to tell people to use OmniFocus because I know half the world out there, it's too complex. They, they don't like it. So I tell people, here's how to decide the genre of software you want from pretty simple to pretty complex to I want to run a thousand person corporation with it. Give them the overview. I present them with a couple. I present Things 3 as the example of good enough but pretty simple to use. I present OmniFocus as the complex and powerful software, maybe a little too complex, but could be just right for some people. And then I present a couple customer relations management software uh, for the people who are, want to run a company, because that's productivity for large groups. But then, you know, having presented the, the, presenting the categories, I link to a web page that is, currently has about a dozen different programs, and that just, you know, Capsule reviews and links out there saying, this is good for this, this is bad for that. They can go to my webpage, or the, it's, it's on the Take Control blog, and go through the software. And in the book and on the webpage, I say, and if these don't work for you, then, you know, I mean, the reason why the webpage is still being updated today is because literally this new software comes out every week. So I tell people, here are the search terms to go for, and here's where to look for advice, and I'm going to try to update the web pages. No promises are made to the reader, but I'll do what I can. Um, so I'll update the, soft, the, the web page with, with what I hear about that I think is good. In, I mean, it's, it's, everything there is excellent at something. Some software I don't recommend, but there's one thing it does, and that's why it's on the page, um, if that's the, the one thing the reader wants. If I find something that is really good that I would want to try out myself someday, because I don't... You, Part of the advice is you don't switch out tools very often. You want to do that slowly and gradually so you don't disrupt yourself. Um, and I give a strategy for when and how to do that. The, uh, you know, but when I find a new tool, I give it a try and see if I can fit it into my system and improve something in a corner of it that I'm currently not using, so not doing. So, I mean, for example, I mentioned in the book, I personally switched from Google Keep to Google Tasks two, three weeks ago because the new Google Tasks came out. 
And there are things that Google Task does better than Google Keep. And for the things that Google Keep does best, I use that. For things that Google Task does best, I do that. OmniFocus is where I run everything. And I have, I have a series of reminders that I call pointers in the book, which is just like programming pointers, where in OmniFocus it says, go look at Google Tasks and see what's there. Go look at Google Keep and see what's there. And then that keeps it all straight, where I can use as many tools as I need to. Some people will use many. I use tons. Some people will use only a few. And the master, you know, I call it the task gap, is the center application, the, 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 the starting point. Just keeps you going. It keeps you looking all the places you put things, so you're always on top of what you're doing. And you can, I can throw something in Google Tasks, and know that every three days, OmniFocus will tell me, "Go look there and make sure you're doing what you're doing." And on the one task list that's that's labeled urgent, that reminder, that pointer, tells me to go on a daily basis. And so I know if I put it there, I'll see it in 12 to 24 hours. So it's reliable, and I get it off my head, and I can do something else. And that's you. Know, I'm going from Big concepts to to details very quickly. So, well, that's and and I, I mean, at some point you have to go to the details because the the concepts are great and they all right. make perfect sense. But then you have to get down to how do you implement them, right? So uh, to answer your question, I think you now I, I use OmniFocus for the illustrations, and OmniFocus is what I know best. So I I use OmniFocus as you know, when I talk about what I personally do, because I, I talk about the mistakes I've made, I talk about what works for me as an exa examples throughout the book. So I'll use OmniFocus for some of that, but I'm very clear they don't have to use it. I think most of your listeners are probably going to be happy with OmniFocus or things. Um, OmniFocus covers the people who want complex stuff that's, uh, you know, powerful stuff that's a little on the complex side. But almost everybody who I've ever heard about on, on podcasts like this one who thought OmniFocus wasn't good for them loves things. And there's a third application called Todoist, which I think is a little simpler than Things, but Todoist is very in interesting because it's available on 12 different platforms. You put your stuff in there, um, you can see it on your Android phone, you can see it on your iPhone, iPad, there's a web page, I think it goes on to Kindle and Amazon Fire tablets, um, and I have an Android phone. The things I have to do to get my data moved around so I can see it anywhere, which I think is important, I have to jump through hoops. Todoist solves the hoops. So if your task management system is simple enough that Todoist isn't constricting, but you have multiple gadgets you want to use, Todoist might be your cup of tea. And that's on the web page to, to get people there. So Jeff, give us some advice. Sure. If, if I'm going to adopt OmniFocus or Things or Todoist or any one of a dozen other different programs, at what point do I say, you know, this just isn't working for me and I need to try something else? How long, right. how long is reasonable to, or if, I don't know if you measure it in time or in tasks or whatever, but, you know, at what point do you, is it, is it acceptable to reject? Because we, we all know that, you know, you put on a, a new pair of shoes for the first time, oh, well, yeah. they don't feel real great, you know, and eventually am, you break them in and they're fine. So I'm laughing because I use exactly that analogy in the book. Really? Okay. Or, I have not read the book, folks. I did not know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I say some people love new gadgets and other people, it gives them blisters. Right. Um, so the, the, the first step is I have a presumption. Anybody who is interested in buying a book called Take Control of Your Productivity is, has a pain point with their current system. So, and they have a system, whether they, they've ever thought about it or not. I mean, they have to-do lists, they have a calendar, they have whatever they use to manage their lives, and I call that their old system of managing themselves. So whatever the pain points are, you, they've already got experience with that. They know maybe they haven't defined it, but they have a vague idea why they picked up the book. So in the book, there's a, there's a chapter on how to transition from your old system to, your, to the, the system you want to use, because this is one of the key things that none of the other books ever told me about. I had to figure it out on my own. And it's horrible to do that on your own, because if you don't know what you're doing, you try the new software. It doesn't work for you in two weeks. You wasted all this. You didn't do anything else in the last two weeks, because you tried to do it all at once. And... At the end of two weeks, it's not working for you. You give up, and you're back to your old system, and you waste it all that time. I once wrote a Fonica Pro database. It took me two months, and I threw it out two weeks after I wrote it. So that's not in the book. But Ouch. don't do it. Anybody, anybody who's listening who's, not, who's a programmer, don't ever do that. Um, <laughs> what? You mean you literally just destroyed it? I, I just stopped using it. I mean, like I, I looked at it six months later, and I'm like, wow, these are great ideas, but it just didn't work. I mean, I, what I thought would work for me didn't work. So in the book, that, that taught me something. That taught me that people who are coming to the book 
going from their current system to a new system, they may not know what they want. So I suggest make your best guess. There's a process to move from your old system to your new system as as painless as possible, where you're using both for a little while. You're relying on your old system at first while you move data into your new system. The more tasks and information that get into your new system, at some point, the new system is a more useful starting point for you. And you use pointers from the old system to the new system, so when you're still looking at your old pages, your old lists, the pointer takes you back to the new system when you, something's there. The new system points you back to the old system for what's there. But you're transitioning over your stuff, and eventually you're just using the new system, and the old system you can put into a file cabinet or set it on fire because that's very satisfying. So the, to, answer, to, to finally get to your question, I say in the book, like this is the one month and the three month period. I say that one month is too soon to really try to change because either you're still getting used to it. Most people don't learn software that well after the first month. I think three months is the first time when you can consider saying, I made a mistake, let's throw it out. Let's try, let's try another transition from where I am now to the new software. Um, but you sh at that point, you've got more data. You know more about what works for you <clears throat> or what didn't work now and didn't work before. So you can narrow it down some. I mean, there's a there's a quote that I think I think I put it in the book. It might have been cut, but the you know the, there's a scientific saying that says there's no such thing as experimental failure. No, there's no such thing as experimental failure. There's only narrowing the path to success. You know, if you learn what doesn't work, then you've narrowed down the, to your path to what will work. So as long as you're working with that information well, so I would say you know give it three months. The exception would be if you try it for two or three weeks and you just know this is a horrible decision and you're not getting anything done, then of course, you, that's, that's when you go back. Um, but most people, uh, you know, the, the people who are in the take control audience who are interested in technology and know what they're doing, but they're not, they're, they're not programmers. So I'm going to assume that there's a certain amount of friction moving into, in, moving into new software and they should be aware of that friction and accommodate it and not think that the problem is their decisions or that their choices don't work, that it's just the, it's just the breaking in of the shoes. And, and I picked one month and three months, but those are, those are rough terms. It's basically up to the reader to decide what it is. But the introduction is do this in one month where you're tweaking around the edges. In three months, you can change some medium-sized pieces or large pieces if it totally doesn't work. In six months is when you're going to do an overview of everything to see if, it's, if you got where you wanted to be in the short term. And then, you know, once a year, you go back to those big goals and tasks and, you know, projects and roles to make sure that what you're doing day to day is fitting with what you wrote down a year ago. Because I tell people to write it down. What you wrote down a year ago to say, this is what I want this all to do for me. And then you figure out a year later, okay, am I, I, I'm more productive. I'm less stressed. I'm in control of things a little better. I've taken control as it were. Um, but am I succeeding at the things that I set out to do? That, you know, am I succeeding at the reasons why I went through this trouble in the first place? And that's, a, that's, a, that's an annual process. And that's the one where I say I am not qualified to tell people how to make those decisions because these are life goal things. I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a priest. So but I do say think about it in whatever ways make sense to you and, and redefine what you do and do this about once a year or maybe once every two years, depending on how often these things change for you. Um, if somebody has a kid, if somebody – changes jobs and moves to a new city, if somebody gets chronically ill, then all of these things change what they intended to do, maybe change what they're capable of doing, and that should be reflected in both what they try to do on a daily basis and what they set out to do over the course of a year or two. And there, there's a large section of the book that says it's called Fail Successfully, and it's when these things come along that are derailing that most people, they just stop using the productivity system and they go back to what they do instinctively, which is horrible at that time because they're in a crisis. Fail successfully basically is a process where you identify that things aren't working for you in a big way because there's other strategies for when it's work, not working in a small way. You identify that you're in a crisis, you've responded in crisis mode. Once you see it, how to get from crisis mode to both the best possible adaptation of what was previously working for you and also to identify what changes in your life you have to make to respond to this this change you know some crises some huge problems are temporary and with a defined ending some are life-changing and there are different strategies for that and i walk people through what to do in, in both cases 
So, I mean, th this is a take control book. Everything that I'm talking about in high fluting and conceptual terms, you know, Joe Kissel made sure that I got it down to step by step by step. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not a point and click book. I don't tell people to point here, click there, choose this menu item. I say, do this step with whatever to tools you've chosen, and think about this thing with every tools you've chosen. Write it down over here. Here being the tool you chose to use to do to keep your notes permanently. Maybe that maybe your main productivity app that you, most of them store notes for you. Um, put it in a place where you'll remember where it is a year from now because you're going to need it. And so, every time I'm talking about this big picture step, big picture idea, I am boiling down to the steps. But what you're doing on Tuesday also has there's a checklist for what you do Tuesday morning and what you do Tuesday evening, and then you repeat it. You can repeat it Monday through Friday. You can repeat it Sunday through Saturday, depending on your preference of what you're trying to manage. So, you know, and that that, that I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, and th and that's one of the reasons that that I was really intrigued when I heard that you were doing this title for for Take Control, because you're right. I mean, Take Control has a bit of an identity, and and mm -hmm. it's you know at the end of the day, it's about doing the things. And I've, I'm like you. I've read plenty of productivity books, and they all have a lot of great concepts. And like you say, the thirty thousand foot level. But they they have they seem to have trouble marrying it down then to to, to the, the nuts and bolts and and, right. the, and and some tools, and then you have the tools manufacturers who are great at saying you know this 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 app can do these twenty five things and has these twenty eight capabilities, but they never really teach you exactly how to think about using it, and so right. there's this big gap in between that most of us seem to try to fill in ourselves. We either start to work from the top down or the bottom up, and I'm not sure we ever really get to where we need to be. Right. Well, I, I have one major advantage in this because the people who write the major books, like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Getting Things Done, these two books published 30 years ago has spawned literally a billion-dollar industry each of sem pardon me, seminars and trainings and large companies teaching what Stephen Covey and David Allen had to say. So they're selling you something when they sell you the book. People who are selling their tools, they're selling you something. They want you to buy your software. Like the OmniFocus manual is one of the best written manuals I've seen in 10 years. But you only get it if you buy the software. So they're going to tell you what to do with it and how to work with, work with it, but they might touch on the philosophy, but they're not going to get into it seriously. I only want to sell you the book. Once you're reading it, you've already bought it. So you know, at that point, I'm free to give what I think is the best advice I can. And so I know what frustrated me. I know what book would have totally changed my life 25 years ago. If somebody had written it then, I wouldn't have had to. And I'm writing the book now that I wanted to read and that I want my readers to be, I wanted to be their last book they ever buy on productivity. You know, maybe they'll browse for some others for, my, for ideas that I didn't cover. I mean, there's always better ideas out there or more ideas, I should say, hopefully not better. Um, but, I mean, you know, a, a a month from now, there'll be more apps, and a year from now, there might be a new philosophy, and they'll find that elsewhere, and if they're really good ideas, and the book sells well, then I'll be in the second edition. But the, the overarching process of adopting a new system, transitioning into it, making sure it works for you, improving it over time, and then figuring out whether it fits into your life, I'm hoping that is, they'll never need another book like that again, because I think that my structure there is universal, even though the individual things that they do with it are going to change with time. Okay, so I, I don't want you to give the whole book away, but there is one. <laughs> other, there, there's one other thing that I, I hear, and I've had it happen to me too. Sure, you you develop a system, you're humming along, you're doing really, really well, and everything is under control, and then something goes awry in your life, and it might be family illness, it might be some kind of natural disaster, it might be you know right. a dozen different things. Maybe it's just you know the three people quit at work, and you've just now increased your Absolutely. workload ridiculously, and in your rush to get to deal with these situations and all, you you kind of just lose your system. Uh -huh. Is there a way to avoid that? I mean, be, or is it is it just self discipline that look? I really need to just no. stick with this. There is no such thing as self discipline in this situation because if you're if you're doing, I mean, so everybody has a certain level of self discipline. I mean, that's one of their natural attributes, right? You can't decide to be more disciplined than you are. You know, you can build the habit of. You build the habit of acting as if you are, and then eventually you become that. I mean, I think it's a psychological way it goes about it. But you can't decide tomorrow, oh, I'm really stressed, so I'm going to work even harder at this one thing, keeping organized. I'm going to, I'm going to be really on top of things. That, that doesn't work. Um, if you're in a derailing situation, 
like the things you talked about. And it doesn't have to be even that big. It could be, you know, a major project, you know, like, like a book or a huge deliverable at work or um, planning a wedding. Any of those things can grow large enough that other things get set aside and those other things eventually pile up and become crises when you didn't know, don't notice. So that's the failing successfully chapter is that I list – everybody should read it the first time through to know when to use it. But they won't use it immediately. They'll read it to identify the uh, – what I call the triggers, the indicators that something has gone seriously wrong. Then they come back I and mean, hopefully they read it through so they have some idea of what to do, but they won't have gone through the steps yet. Then they come back to the chapter and they go step by step. And they say, okay, identify the crisis. Identify what went wrong that got you to the point where you're now reading this chapter again. Um, the first thing I tell people to do is attend to the crisis. If you are dealing with a sick parent or a sick child and that is taking up all your time and your child needs you, well, everything else is going to go away for a while and that's all there is to it. You don't have time to sit down and fiddle with your productivity system until things get a little more stable and you know what your new normal is when you can make that time. So attend to those things first. Attend to any emergencies arising from it. Like if you're going to lose your job, you, you, you know, if, you go, if you're losing your job, it means you lose your health insurance and that's going to cause you more problems. Suddenly your job is much more important than if it's stable and a steady paycheck that you can kind of phone it in for a while. So, and then there's other steps to say, okay, I'm going to transition from this crisis mode slowly back to where I was when it was working. And then once the crisis is either, I mean, there are three ways it can go. The crisis can end the crisis can get easier over time but never go away or the crisis is permanent and doesn't get easier you know certain physical is it chronic illnesses are like that so depending on what situation you're in you adjust your system you don't try to go back to your old ways of doing it if those don't apply to your current life but you figure out what to do and you adjust it and you tweak it and you go into this sort of iterative loop within the crisis chapter and then once you're at what you think is your new normal and things are sort of working for you, then you start doing the regular system again, the, reg the regular book process with what you develop to manage the crisis. And you move that back into normal and you move forward with whatever change in your life properly, reflecting what your circumstances are and maybe what your change goals are. So, But is that – I hear what you're saying and it makes – again, it makes perfect sense. But I have to ask – is the fact that my productivity system didn't hold up under the stress, is that indicative of a failure of the productivity system? Or is I don't it... think so. Uh, okay. I mean, you can cert it certainly could be. Um, here, here's the thing. The, the software and the notepads and the iPhone running five different apps, all these things are tools, right? The engine of the system is you. And you're not a machine. You are a human being with emotions and frailties and things you're not good at, things you're excellent at, and derailing life events. So it's not a question that the system is broken. It's more likely the system worked for Chuck Joyner a year ago. Not you personally, but you know, yeah. your name came to mind. It worked for Chuck Joyner a year ago. It doesn't work for Chuck Joyner now. Chuck Joyner has to figure out what to do to make his system work better for him again. So, yeah, I mean, if, in some situations, if you decide to retire from podcasting and move to Aruba, you're going to go through your task app and delete half the things you're doing right now because you're never going to do them again. Um, you know, it's going to be a whole new pro process for you. And maybe because living in Aruba is a totally different lifestyle, well, you don't need the same software you used before. That's a possibility. So, you know, good things and bad things can, can cause this kind of process. Um, I think, the, I mean, the main point I want to get across is that don't think of it in terms of the software is broken or that you, I mean, usually when I read a book and it didn't work, I think I screwed up. The, the, the crucial thing is you're doing the best you can with the tools you have. You're improving your tools. You're improving your skills at managing yourself. And you're doing the best you can, and that's good enough. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a fault situation. And you know, I hadn't thought of it in terms of blaming the software. Um, it's possible. There's some software that's just bad. But I think it's, I think it's more the case that I'm trying to think of how to phrase this properly. It's more, more a case of maybe you didn't know yourself well enough. Like I didn't know myself well enough when I wrote the FileMaker Pro database. Maybe you didn't know yourself well enough to know what would work for you. So you chose the wrong tools, and now it's time to go back to that step and pick better ones. You know, the iteration is what you do when 
it's not working and nothing in terms of failure. I mean, like one of the like if you decide, I'll say I'll say in my terms. If I decide that um, I'm not going to go to the gym, there's a practice I'm not going to do because it's a quality of life issue. I don't want to sweat. I don't say to myself, well, I'm never going to get healthy. I'll come up with different ways of getting healthier because I don't have a, you know, that's just, you don't, you don't throw the baby out with bathwater in that situation. So when you change your practices and your tools for being more productive, you don't say, well, there's something wrong with me. I'm always going to be lazy or a screw up or um, unable to focus. A lot of people say those things. I say yeah. those, I've said those things. Um, instead of going to there, you say, well, I tried something, it didn't work, I'll try again. And maybe something, like, it took me 25 years. So I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> that's a long process, and you can, try and you can try a bunch of different things. I don't want to say that I failed the entire time. A bunch of things worked for a while, and then they didn't. A bunch of, like, it was only about eight or 10 years ago the software got to be any good, that's why I was writing my own. So, but the software has gotten better over time, and now it's good enough that most people can just take something off the shelf. Um, the books are not great, that's why I wrote mine. So I, I think the tools are good enough now that most people can probably put something together off the shelf if they have the right advice and if they know the right steps. And yeah, if it doesn't work for them, then go to one of the five or six different places in the book where I say, well, if this isn't working, do this. If this isn't working, do that. Um, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, 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 like, I like what you're saying. I like what you're saying because it's, I mean, it's like you, know, you can't build an eight-lane highway for 40 minutes of rush hour. You know, just right. economically it doesn't work. And right. so maybe some of us have to get used to the idea that, number one, maybe our systems have to evolve or completely alter. Mm -hmm. And maybe they were just never built to handle that particular load. You know, it, it, and so you just have to acknowledge that there are times that you need to go off-road and abandon the system, like you like you were saying. Mm -hmm. and because, I, again, you know, there are times that I felt – I've gone through those periods for, for various reasons – and and I've I've abandoned systems because of it because like okay so if it can't handle this then I must not be doing it right or I need something different mm -hmm. and maybe I need to re re-examine that as to okay it just wasn't built to handle that particular load but for the average day it's just fine right well and this is why I mean what, what worked for me and what I and and the what, what extrapolated from what individually worked for me pardon me to a generic practice with these pointers from one app to another. So, you know, I have certain reasons why I use Google Keep. I have certain reasons why I use Google Tasks. I have certain reasons why I put things directly into OmniFocus. I have certain reasons why I create an Omni Outliner document. And I, I explain these in the, in, the, in, the, in the book, you know, in, with my examples. When you're talking about how things don't work because they don't handle the, the flow or the, the, I mean, you know, the, the, the volume of tasks or the complexity of tasks, Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to throw everything out, a pointer from one tool to another tool, and a, a tool could be, you know, I've got a, there's a whiteboard on the other side of this room. A tool could be a whiteboard where you put things out. It could be um, the glove compartment of your car where you throw things to remind, you of thing, remind yourself of things later. Um, you know, and if you use the glove compartment to store things that you want to be reminded of, then you put in your task app, OmniFocus in my case, a reminder once a week to go check your glove compartment because... You don't want to be reminded when you're in your car or you're driving somewhere. You need to be reminded when you can do the thing that you want to be reminded of or you can write down the thing. So that th th this interlocking pointer system, which can be very simple for three or four apps, you know, pages, numbers, Apple Mail, uh, you know, your task app, like things, and a calendar. That's all you need. Um, that can be a very simple system, or you could do what I do and have 40 different apps across five different platforms, literally. Um, and if I need to improve something, if something isn't working for me, well, I just swap something out. I add Google Tests, I remove Google Keep. I use Omni Outliner for different things, or I switch to something. I got just, literally three days ago, I installed an Outliner app on my Android phone because I was able to figure out how to, I can now get my Google, I can get my Omni Outliner files on my Android phone through Dropbox. Take some jumping through hoops, I lose a few features in Omni Outliner that I can't have anymore, but anything that I Manage within Omni Outliner, which so I use Omni Outliner for anything that I have to manage, where I need to share the document because nobody sees my Omni Focus document. That you know, the Omni Focus document is private and personal; no one sees that. Omni Outliner is when I do a document that I want to share with my clients. 
I want those to sync everywhere. I want to see them on my phone. So I added a new tool on my phone. I use Dropbox, which is a tool I'm already using. And suddenly, things that I'm storing on my Mac, I can now see on my Android phone when I'm walking to Starbucks or when I'm on a bus. So that's what I mean by adding new tools and figuring out what works. Now, I could have said, Omni Outliner is broken. I need to stop doing that thing. Or I could have said, well, all of Omni Group's software is broken. I need to throw it all out. Uh, you know, but uh, you, you, you only modify, you, you tweak and you modify smaller, medium, and large pieces depending on what is and is not working for you. That, does that answer your question? Oh, question? yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, you've given me a lot to think about. And, given the, and, and I haven't even read the book yet. Mm -hmm. Just in this discussion, you know, that, that you have to evaluate, I guess, your tools, your needs. I especially what, like what you said about, you know, being, not being afraid to throw things out, not being able to, or not, not being afraid to add new tools. I think that's, right. that's something I believe I'm guilty of, that I've been looking for that one place or that one thing that will solve all my problems. And if, if, if it's not program A, or method A, then I'm going to move on to program B and method B and C and D and E. Right. And there's nothing wrong with having A, E, and F, you know, as as interlocking systems, if you will. Right. And, and that's I, – I like that idea because, it, frankly, it takes a little stress off the idea of trying to find the perfect thing. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, like the, the last time we saw each other at CES, you know, we were at the PepCon event or one of the – CES unveiled one of those. Every year they hand me a notebook, Right. I don't use it at CES. I throw it in the back of my bag. I make sure there's a pen in the bottom of a pocket. I forget about it. But if I'm ever somewhere that I have all of my gadgets and four dead batteries, it rarely <laughs> happens, but sometimes, I pull out the pen and paper, and I can write things down there. I charge my phone. I take a picture of every page that I wrote down so I can throw out the paper because I'm horrible at that. It's a known weakness that I don't want it. Like This is what we were talking about before, about trying to force yourself to do things you can't do. I can't do paper. So anything that I need... Anything I write down on paper, anything paper gives, anybody who gives me paper, except for money, I take a picture and I throw away the paper, right? So if I'm without pen, if I'm without electrical power, I'm off in the woods somewhere for a week, then I write down what I need to. Next time I can, I take pictures. I have a pointer that takes me to Google Photos to remind me to go through my photo stream. And because, you know, I don't take many real pictures, most of these are, are reminders of things. You know, I'll see a. Um, I'll see a newspaper article that says, try this restaurant. I'll take a picture if I'm not on the web. Um, I see a, an ad on a SEPTA sign that sounds interesting. I'll take a picture. It goes in my photo stream. Three days later, I check the photo stream. I see the picture. I write it into OmniFocus. I'm done. Um, also how I deal with paper. But the, the pen and paper, I don't think I've actually written anything on that for three years. But every year when they hand me a free notepad, I throw out the old one because it's kind of banged up at that point. I throw in the new one. I make sure the pen works, and I'm done for a year. So, <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love to keep on going with this, you know, for a few hours, and then we'd end up talking about the whole book. So, but if I don't, if you don't mind, I have one thing that's very important to me oh, that please, I do want to add. Please. So, this isn't in the book; it's in the web content. Um, I have attention deficit disorder and bipolar disorder, which, as I've gotten older, has basically become chronic depression. So, this is one of the reasons why all these things fail for me is because. Sometimes I get depressed where I'm useless for two months. I always have ADD, which means my brain literally cannot focus on things the way other people focus. It's different kinds of ways that I can pay attention. Sometimes people with ADD can sometimes pay a lot of attention for a long period of time and then forget about everything. So in the book, there are a couple points where I say some of the problems you might be having organizing yourself and some of the problems you might be having not caring about what you're doing or not, you know, not being motivated to do it, they could be symptoms of a mental health problem. You know, most people have minor issues that come and go, but in those places, I link to a web page where there's a list of descriptions and a list of resources, and that one I will keep updated. And if I, you know, something like, I think the number is 15% of the country will experience major depression in the next three years. Um, ADD is underdiagnosed in anybody who's 35 or older because we're too old to have caught it in school. So my, my goal is that among the general readership, people who don't know they have these problems and who blame themselves for things that everybody else seems to be able to do properly, I provide just enough information to get them thinking about it. They go to my webpage and they can learn how to do it. But the corollary is for everybody who does not have these problems right now, because it comes and goes, 
Um, I mean, depression can happen to anybody in the future. Everybody else should understand that if these things work for me and my brain is literally broken, diagnosed by a doctor is broken, and, and certain productivity things will never work for me, certain techniques, this process worked for me. And I think it can work for anybody. But it's very important to me that people who might have these issues or might know somebody with these issues, I mean, you know, so many people are miserable their entire lives because they think it's their fault and they blame themselves and they use terms about mental illness that they would never use about, oh, well, I have cancer, so because of my chemo, I can't work as hard. No one blames themselves for that. People blame themselves all the time because they can't get out of bed for a week because they're de clinically depressed. It's a neurochemical issue, but they think, oh, I'm just lazy. I'm a horrible person. I'm unreliable. And I really want to reach those people. So if anybody in your audience is, thinks they hear a bell ringing right now, or think they hear the beginning of a bell, it sort of, sort of reflects what, they, what they've experienced in the past. I hope they read the book and I hope they check out the resources. And that particular chapter, um, it's going to be on the blog. Um, Joe will probably be unhappy if I say this, but the blog, you don't have to buy the book to get to it. So, um, <laughs> But you, do, you will have to buy the book to understand how that fits into everything else, of course. Thank you. I know. I mean, that that takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there like that. And I know it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Uh, it, it shouldn't. shouldn't take but any more it does. courage to say I have depression than to say I have uh, I have diabetes. It should not be any different. Um, it, yeah, it and that's why I say it. It shouldn't. But in our society, let's face it. You know, I I, I think there is a stigma that goes along with some of that until you get yeah. beyond that. And getting beyond it can be as simple as having a friend or a family member who suffers through it, and then you start to understand that. So, Absolutely. But, but at the end of the day, there's, it's still there. So th thank you, because you really, are, you really are putting yourself out there, and hopefully we're helping some people along the way. Jeff, I, I want to prepare folks for this. Um, how, how many pages, and I know we're, folks were recording this just a little bit ahead of publication, so we don't right. have everything locked down yet. But oh, it's how, it's how, pretty locked down. Is it's it pretty, 167 okay. pages. How many? Uh, 167. Okay, once, so very manageable. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and that includes the, you know, Joe's thing at the end where he says copyright and fine print. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, 167 pages. I want to say there's probably about 10 or 12 chapters. Each one is... I mean, you know, some someone some of the chapters you'll spend time in there, but they're all bite sized and they're broken. Bro you know, it's a take control style. Everything's broken down to a manageable amount of information at a time. Um, I don't think it's overwhelming. I think Joe. I mean, Joe had sent me back a bunch of drafts of this book, where he said, "Cut this; it's extraneous. Tighten that; it needs it needs to be clearer." Um, you know, some edits I was doing yesterday was Joe said this particular paragraph needs to be explained better, so I explained it better and sent it back to him. That was the last thing I did. Um, these edits really annoyed me because there were a lot of work sometimes and Joe is a fantastic editor who really knows his stuff and a week later I'm like I can't believe how much clearer this book is now and how much better it is so yeah. I hope it's but I don't know I mean like I'm not my readers I don't know what's going to work for them and I hope they email me to say what worked and what didn't um, but I, I you know, my instinct is that it's going to work for most people and actually I should say at the end of the book when I say, there's a chapter called, are you rereading this book? And there's a chapter in there that say, if this book did not work for you, here's what to do next. You know, if, if the whole process doesn't work, because I've been through that, I've been through processes where I tried something for a year and it just did not work for me at all, it never took, I say, well, here's what I did to go on to the next thing. So if the book doesn't work, here's what you do. But I think, I think most people who get to that chapter, again, I shouldn't telegraph, it's there, but most people who get to that chapter won't throw out everything because at the end of that process, it's like the scientific experiment. At the end of that process, they will know more about work and what didn't work. They will have it defined granularly enough and written down so that whatever they do next, the next book they try, the next software they try, the next organizational style they try, their time will have been well spent because it will inform what they do next. And maybe what they do next is the next edition of the book because if I get better ideas, or new ideas, or I hear back my readers telling me what worked for them and what didn't, you know, as long as the book is selling, I'm sure Joe and I'll be happy to put out new editions. So if I can improve <laughs> the book, I certainly will. You know? Do we uh, do we have a price on this yet, Jeff, that you know It's fourteen ninety nine. dollars Okay. Um, it, I'm assuming it will be available by the time you put this out um, at TakeControlBooks.com. Uh, my email address is TakeControl at JeffPorton.com, uh, which will probably be in your show notes, I'm sure. 
And people can reach me at Twitter at Jeff Porton. So those the those are the ways to get in touch with us. Perfect. Jeff, thank you. I th- thank you for the book. Thank you for the interview. This is this is really interesting. I'm I'm looking forward to spending some time with this book and re-examining some maybe some things I have abandoned and maybe trying out some new things. But it's well, you know, if anybody reads the book and heard about it here, then mention that in the email you send me and I'd love to know. So. Yeah, please do. Please do, folks. Jeff, thank you. I, I hope this is not the well, we will make sure this is not the last time you're here. Even if Absolutely. We, even if we and don't Jeff, have another book. You told me what your upcoming schedule is like. If there's anything I can do for you to help you manage your schedule, after you read the book, give me a call and I can you know, give you some personal advice because <laughs> you are absolutely nuts coming up in the next couple of weeks and I want to help you out. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks man. so much. It's great to see you. Take care, man. Thanks for your time. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. I hope this has been as interesting for you as it has been for me. I'm really excited because this book appears to, from what Jeff has said, it addresses concepts, it addresses some tools, and it, it, it marries that, fills in that big gap in the middle that I mentioned that I feel like exists for so many of us. So we will see. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Mac Voices Facebook group, And get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash macvoices and join these folks who help keep Mac Voices coming to you. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.